black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I, I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me. And this look of, I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was, he, was, he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? Sure. Uh, Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Ah, Friday night. It's good to be back with everyone. How's your week been? Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to listen tonight. I'll be welcoming Georgie to the show. And Georgie had a very uh, fascinating encounter out there in Oklahoma. It's when he was fishing. The part of his encounter I'm really fascinated by was he ran into a female. And a lot of times you don't get too much aggression from females. And he did. And not only did he see it, his father saw it, his wife saw it, a lot of different family members saw it. And you'll see this type of behavior a lot of times with fishermen, a lot of rock throwing, that sort of thing. So pay attention to the details tonight. Then I'll also be talking to Denise. And Denise is from Texas. She had a an encounter. She had many encounters on her property. She didn't really know what it was until one night that she actually saw it. Um, and when she saw this creature, she describes it as having a Joker-like smile. Um, and that's not the first time I've heard it. Uh, very, very fascinating stuff. Can't wait to uh, to talk to both of them. Actually, before we jump into it, here's a clip that Denise sent me when they were out hiking on the Lone Star Trail. Take a listen. I don't want to track this. One time. Do you think it was a person? Do you think that was a person? I don't know. If it was. I mean, it might have been. I'm like shaking right now. Okay. That scared me. I don't know. Listen. I have to get it on tape. Holy God. Let's get out of here. Let's get out of here indeed. We'll get into that and much more tonight. If you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out the website, sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member, get additional shows. And if you get a chance, check out the shop at the top. Get yourself some merchandise. Uh, let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome Georgie to the show. Georgie, thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Yeah, and, and you had a very, very fascinating encounter in Oklahoma back in 1999. If you would, would you mind kind of starting from the beginning and just kind of walk yeah. us into what happened? Well, we uh, we uh, grew up fishing. My dad's always taken us fishing and my wife loves to fish and I'm, and I've moved away. I live in Texas now, but, uh, so any chance I get to go up there and go fish with my pop, I do it. So one day he calls, he's got this new two man boat and we're going to take it out to this place called Cumberland Cove. It's, uh, it's actually a, like a part of uh, Lake Texoma, but it's way, way out in the middle of the, the, uh, Washita river bottoms is one of the feeder rivers there. And so we, 
climbing through the pickup, my dad and my wife in the front, and me and my uncle and my cousin in the back with his little two-man boat, and we drive out into the middle of nowhere. We're in the river bottom woods. The, it's all oak trees and briars. It's real thick. You have to go across. A, it's it's all public land, but uh, some of the people raise horses and cows out there. So we, you driving across cattle guards and everybody on a one-way dirt road into the fishing area. <clears throat> we called it the rock levee is what we call it. It's a huge levee with rocks down the side. And uh, there's a spot at the very front when you come in, you're coming in from the east and you put the, we parked there, my dad and um, unloaded the boat, put it in the water and he takes the battery out of the truck to run the trolling motor on the boat. And him and my wife get on this boat. This is like probably three or four in the afternoon, maybe yeah, right around there. And they're, out fishing on the boat so me and my uncle and my cousin walk about 25 30 yards down the bank to start fishing and uh we're catfishing and uh done it a thousand times been in these I, everybody says i grew up in the woods i know the sounds like i didn't just grow up in the woods i grew up in these woods this is where i was raised in this area yeah and so we were fishing and uh if you go up this levee it's a pretty tall levee it's about 20 25 foot up and it's pretty new. It, at the time, it was pretty new. And so on top of the levee, they've, they've got the rocks on the bottom coming up. They've planted trees along the top, and they're sapling trees. Well, me and my wife had just bought a house, and we're uh, going to put in trees. We're trying to figure out what kind of trees. So I'm up there looking at these trees, and I realize, hey, there's a river. I'm going to fish it. I've always done good back there. Well, on the top of the levee, the trees were brand new. They're six foot tall. I'm 5'8". These things were just barely above my head. And so I took notice of them, and I was telling her, they had the tags on there, what kind of trees, so I was making notes to figure out what I wanted. I go down to the river, and I start fishing. And the whole time there, it was eerie quiet. You know, it was, I had a hair standing up all over me. I was scared to death. I, it was weird. I'm never. I'm not scared to go in the woods. I've, me and my cousins stayed out all the time, all night fishing, and I've never been scared. But I had a weird, scary feeling, and and I'd walk up and down a little bit, and after about 45 minutes, I was like, man, this is, I was creeped out, so I'm going to go back with my uncle and my cousin that were fishing. You know, we said up and weren't catching fish, or he, my uncle's catching fish. We have a stringer that we put the fish on, and we keep it about 20 yards further down from us so that uh, water moccasins don't come up on us, because we've had them come up to the stringer before. And we've been fishing probably two hours, so it's getting about 5.30. And uh, my uncle's going to put fish on the stringer. And every, it started about 5.30, and about every 20 minutes he'd catch fish, he'd say, man, y'all got to cut that out. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, I know you're throwing rocks. I said, I don't, there's nobody throwing rocks. He's like, I know you are. Said, They're hitting me. He says, every time I go over there, y'all start throwing rocks. I said, no, we're not throwing rocks, bro. And he's like, yeah. About that time, while we're arguing this, this pretty good-sized rock comes flying over the levee and lands in the water. And this is out in the middle of nowhere. There's no houses, no trailers, nothing out there. One, Like I said, there's a one road in. So I'm like, man, I don't know what that is. It was right where I had been fishing. So we, we beat the trail back to the truck and start hollering for my wife and my dad. And now all this is taking place over, like I said, a couple of hours. So they come back in. They don't have lights on the boat. And my dad's this big, you know, he's like, y'all are crazy. He thinks we're putting him on because my uncle likes to scare. He, he's famous for scaring people. And he's, he's like, you're just putting this on. I don't believe anything. We're going to keep fishing. I was like, all right. So I didn't know. I My dad makes me kind of, I don't know. I, I was maybe 30 years old, but my dad's my protector. So I felt, all right, if my dad's not scared, then I'm cool. I'll stay there. So we go down there and it was scary. I'm not going to lie. I was, I was scared. We were probably fishing another hour and a half. It was just, the sun was just about to go down. It was about eight 30. I was taking a, to put a fish on the stringer. I was walking down and my wife is, you know, she's a, she wouldn't believe in anything. And, she, and she's here, but she won't come talk. She's scared, but she still won't admit to what she saw, or she'll tell you what she saw, but she doesn't know what it is. But I went to the stringer to put the fish on, and I was over there, and all of a sudden I'm getting hit by rocks. And we, and, and between the time we told my dad and them that what happened and the time we were there, 
nothing had happened. We hadn't heard anything, no rocks were thrown, nothing. And all of a sudden, rocks are hitting me, and I'm like, okay. He told my dad, and now my dad's doing this to scare me or to poke fun at me. So I was turning around to tell him that, uh, you know, cut it out. This ain't funny. And I turn around and look, and all four of them are staring up the – now I'm getting nervous. <laughs> it scared me. They were all staring up the levee scared looking i mean like like they're i thought they were looking at a ufo or something the way their heads were looking i turn around and look and there's something has its left hand is holding on to the side of the tree and it's picking up those rocks from the rock levee and it's throwing them at me i'm like what in the world i didn't I couldn't believe somebody be out there you, you have to walk forever to get there and why are they throwing rocks at me you know and my uncle yells hey cut it out like that and this thing stood up and Wes, I'm telling you, this thing had to be seven and a half, eight foot tall. It, was, it towered over the little sapling tree. And my wife can tell you, it was double wide of, of a human. And it started grunt. It was swaying side to side. It started grunting. And it dropped its hand down. Oh, and then, so I'm like, what in the world? I turn look, everybody's running full speed to the truck. And I'm like, I'm the last one here, and I'm the furthest from the truck. So I was terrified. I took off running. I got to, we got to the truck. Everybody's trying to jump in. My dad jumps in. He turns the key in the, in the truck won't start. He had taken the battery out for the boat. And when he put it in, he didn't tighten down the terminals. And so he's in there. He up the top of the hood and this whole time. When I turned back around, we had left fishing poles, everything. I turned back around, nothing. I, I don't see anybody. The levee's clear and we're, you know, hollering, screaming, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. And he finally gets it started, and we get out of there. And I told my dad, so we, I mean, we're laying in the back of the truck. I'm pinned up against the the tailgate of the truck because I'm terrified. The The woods are on you. It's like a canopy over you getting out of there. And um, my dad's flying, and, you know, it's throwing us around, but I was, I didn't care. I, didn't, I was stuck to that, to the bed of that truck on the bottom against the tailgate. But we got out. We finally made it to a, a little town called Marietta, and a, my, well, I mean, we didn't stop. It, it hit the highway, and Marietta is probably about a 20-mile drive from where we were, and uh, we finally got there, and I was like, what in the world was that? And he's like, I don't know what it was, and my wife's like, it, it was huge. I said, I know it was huge. I don't know what it was, and she's like, I don't know, and my uncle's like, it's a bitch, but I told y'all. I've, I've heard it out there before. I'm like, you didn't tell me anything about hearing anything like that. Well, growing up, we had there was a the story that Bear told you about the uh, the attack out there at, at a uh, right across the Red River. There was a there was a we called it a creature booger. My grandma called it a creature booger, and she said there was one, and it was called the Randolph Bottom Monster. There's a little bottoms area right in between where that attack happened, and where we saw this. And there, uh, back in the day, I remember as a kid, there was a picture in the paper that a that a school bus driver dropped all the kids off. In, in a little town called Medill, right there, right by where it is, and he's driving out. He sees this thing cross the street, and he, I, somehow, oh, he was. He had a picture of it. I think they were on a field trip, and the and the guy had a camera in his bus, and he got a picture of this thing, and it was just the back part of it. So, but they and and so when that attack happened, that Bear was talking about that time. Uh, a lot of people thought it was a uh, devil worships, and my grandma always told me that it was uh, the Randolph Bottom monster. I asked my uncle, I said, what, you never told me a story about you having a Bigfoot encounter. I thought grandma was just trying to scare me. She would tell us ghost stories and all kind of stuff. And he said, yeah, it was me and your dad. I said, well, my dad doesn't believe in Bigfoot. He said, yeah, but something happened. I said, what happened? And uh, uh, on the Washita River, which is about three miles from where all this happened, when uh, he, him and my uncle were fishing, and it was about two o'clock in the morning, and uh, they heard something crashing. These little sapling trees were falling. These little, uh, oh, they're not sapling trees. They are cottonwood trees that aren't full grown. But the Washita River is all that red sand, so nothing stands there. You could push a tree down pretty easy if it ain't full grown. He said something was knocking trees down and hollering, and they jumped up this big hill and got in the car and left, and they left a gun and everything. I said, well, what'd you think it was? He said, it was a Bigfoot. I heard it holler. My dad said, it could have been hogs. It could have been anything. I said, if it was hogs and you had a gun, why'd you get up and leave? He said, I was scared. I didn't know what it was knocking trees down. I said, well, 
if you don't, for somebody don't believe in Bigfoot, it seems like you had a couple encounters, but he, he'll still tell you he doesn't know what it is and that it, he don't believe in Bigfoot. But something's out there, man. We, uh, it was scary. It, it was, uh, the, the creature we saw was backlit. It was, uh, the sun was kind of going down and you couldn't see a lot of details. The, the, what I could see, I could tell it was a female. It had breasts. When it, when it stood up, uh, its breasts were, you could tell it had breasts and it had, uh, like a conical shaped head and it's in a uh, long arms. I mean, the longest arms I've ever seen in this thing was huge. It was, it was wide. It was the widest. If it, I don't know why it, it had to be as wide as two and a half, three, three regular size human beings. This was the biggest thing I've ever seen. And my wife was the same way. She, she, uh, she said, I've never seen anything that big. If she, if she still won't go back. Now, the place where we were is different. The dam broke, and when they fixed it, it changed the water flow, and now they put in a house in additions, and, and it's high-dollar lakeside uh, property. So it's not, it's nothing like it was now, so you could go back there. But but until that all happened, we wouldn't go back. I left all my fishing stuff, and like I said, I'm a, I'm a fisherman, so I had good stuff. My dad had good stuff. We just left it all there, and I don't know where it is. It might still be there for all I know. I wanted to ask you about uh, Bear. Are you talking about the story when I had him on the Christmas show and he was talking yeah. about, talking about the, the female that was ripped open? Was and, the, yeah. yeah, it was on the hood of the car. That was a big story when we were growing up. Yeah, we uh, that place is uh, – there's the big casinos there now, but you can still go down there, but it's still spooky. We, even even in high school, <laughs> we had heard about that story, and that's where we would go if, if we trying to scare each other. And it's, it's scary down there. It's a – I know I, the thing. That, the thing that about it is, Wes. To be honest with you, I didn't think there was a Bigfoot around there because it's not thick woods. It's, uh, there's parts of it that have thick woods, but it, it it don't seem to me like a place that is thick enough woods that would uh, uh, sustain a an animal that big or where it could hide. You know what I mean? It just doesn't look like that yeah. thick of woods. But uh, th- where where this where that happened, where that attack happened, where the lady was on the car. There was another attack there that happened before that, that a uh, that a guy died. They went down in in a same place. I mean, it's it's a maybe two hundred yards from where that a graveyard is. That Indian, it's an Indian graveyard is where this happened. That Brown Brown Springs, there's an Indian graveyard there. It's up a hill, up like a little levee up the hill. But you can go back in there in in into the bottoms toward the Red River. It's the Red River uh, basin is what it is. And you can go back in there, and the woods get pretty thick, and it's got that high grass. Like, if you get out, there's grass that would uh, – like, we just went down there the other day to help a guy move some stuff. My, da- my dad, you know, help uh, work with a guy that lives out that way. And there's grass that will get up to your waist or higher. The, it almost looks like hay, that yellow grass. And it lays down. You can see where hogs uh, make a waller out of them and, or a nest out of them. And you can see stuff like that. But – uh. There was another attack down there when a man was down there supposedly bird hunting and they found him dead and it's and he had uh, two dogs and both dogs uh had their neck broke. So I don't I don't know I always thought it was just somebody being mean. It, like I said I to be honest with you I didn't know there was enough woods there to to sustain an animal that big. It, and I've never been scared there. But see, I'm telling you uh growing up there's a little town. There, there's a natural, there's a wildlife refuge there in, in a town called Tishomingo. And my aunt and them lived in a little bitty. It didn't even have uh, gravel roads. It was just all dirt roads. A place called Butcher Pen, and they named it after they they used to slaughter hogs down there. In a but a, it's got a river. It's got a lake. Butcher Pen lakes there. And growing up, that's where I spent all summer long out in the woods. And we would hear something scream. Like a lady screaming, and my and my aunt always told us it was a a wildcat or a panther, and uh, I never saw one. I saw one uh, this year. Me and my brother saw one in a, uh, on the road. But growing up, I I never even saw that. We would hear screams and hollers, but she always told us it was a panther. So that's what we thought it was. I didn't think it. Was, like I said, I, even when I was younger, I didn't think it was enough woods to have a bigfoot. But uh, since this, since that's happened, since I saw listening to show. Hearing weird things, we still go up there. That's I live here in Texas, but I don't know the fishing holes down here, so I go up there all the time. Plus, my dad's up there, and we so we still go fishing up there a lot around that 
wildlife refuge and we'll hear stuff the the uh probably about well it was on a martin luther king day me and my nephew went up there and it was five in the morning we built the fire we were at lake butcher pen and we were out there fishing and you could it sounded like a baby crying out in the woods and i never heard that before i don't know what it was but uh after we heard that baby crying it got deathly quiet and you could hear something it sounded like a, it was almost like a a yodel like a yodel scream like a whoop but it was more of a yodel kind of a whoop so i don't know what it was it was cold uh again out in the country but now i want to hear that stuff i get a little nervous since since uh, we had that encounter i don't blame you i don't blame you at all man and, and the he, thing and oh, go ahead i'm sorry no no, no go ahead i was gonna say that the, the the i've run into all kind of animals out there and uh i've been a little nervous around a big snake or something like that but and I was scared this stuff. This thing had, and I grew up fighting. I, I boxed. I've, and I grew up in a neighborhood where you fought a lot. So I'm not scared of a lot of things. But uh, this thing had the body language, like it was about to come down the hill. I was scared. It, it was a, uh, it was an aggressive tone this thing took. And that's why I ran. That's why I left my fishing poles and stuff. And the, uh, the same thing you know, when I was watching the, we go to Minnesota. And my aunt would show us some films, and she had the encyclopedias of the Rob, the Patterson Gimlin film, and the pictures. So when I grew up, I thought that's what it was. It looked like a it, that that a uh, Bigfoot on that film looked docile to me, like it was friendly. This thing didn't have a friendly tone to it. It was scary, and I and I haven't seen another one since then. I've heard some noises that maybe maybe not, but I, I'll be honest with you, I don't. And and I always thought it'd be fun to find a Bigfoot. Me and my buddies would go. And it was just to hang out. You know, we we go out and have a camping trip, say we're going to go Bigfoot hunt. But really, we was just hanging out, eating s'mores. When, I'm telling you, I don't want to see this thing. I was scared. I don't want to be that scared again. Yeah, I don't blame you. It, it's interesting, the behavior you'll see a lot of times with, and I've heard this time and time again, with fishermen. It's the same MO. They'll throw rocks, you know, and they'll yeah. uh, try and make you leave. I think they more or less want the fish, especially when That's you're fishing. Okay. You know what's funny is I thought the same thing. Uh, I hadn't even thought about it until I saw listening to your show. I, I try to tell somebody, and, you know, they want to shut you down or start laughing. So, you know, it's kind of a I, – I want to tell people. I and mean, that sounds funny, but, man, that was, a, that was probably one of the more upsetting things that ever happened to me growing up. I've had a pretty good life. I ain't had nobody die or anything bad happen, but that was that man that scared me. And uh, when you tell people and they want to laugh at it, they don't understand. It's hard to get them to understand what I was feeling. But uh, after I listened to your show and I started thinking about the story again, I was telling my wife the only time that thing threw rocks was when we were over by the the stringer where we were putting the fish. That's the only time it never threw rocks any time other other than you were over there. So I don't know. I, it was after our fish. I don't know what it, man. It, it was. I've, and uh, I've talked to, uh, I've got an uncle who, like I said, that lives out there. He's never seen anything. He said he's heard a couple of things that scared him, but nothing that he could ever say for sure. But I'm telling you for sure, what I saw was not a man. And, and it was huge. Biggest thing I've ever seen. I, I And I've heard your story. My, I, I couldn't tell that it was a bodybuilder. Like I said, it was backlit, but I, it was wide and big. And it was giant. It was, oh man, I... Like I said, I've had ideas of what a Bigfoot encounter would be like growing up. My grandma telling stories, but it didn't happen anything like I thought. I wasn't prepared. I wasn't. I wasn't going there looking for Bigfoot, so I wasn't prepared. And it kind of happened, and it, and I panicked. To be honest with you, when my dad ran, like I said, he was my protection. My dad's around, I feel safe. My dad ran, I was scared. I was already scared, but when he ran, I was really scared. I don't want to have nothing to do with it. So. Yeah, no, I don't blame you. You know, it's interesting though, in like hunters encounters. It's a different type of encounter with a hunter. And I don't know if it's because of the gun that changes the, the yeah. game for them or not. Uh, but with fishermen, it, you know, people out fishing, it tends to happen this way. I think it's interesting, too, that it was female, that you noticed that it yeah. was female. And the strange part is, too, you know, you have three, four, five people looking at this thing, and yep. it stands up out on the open and comes right out. That's when yeah. – you know, you're you you were probably your feelings of, of being in danger were probably right because if it's <laughs> yeah. going to step out like that with all those people around, uh, it wasn't coming down for a hug. Yeah, and it was it had the high ground on us. That was the other thing. It's like I, that's what I told my dad. If it was a person, I, I tell the reason. If it was a person, 
And there's four or five of us. They didn't know if we had a gun. Everybody out there carries a gun. You know, it's like, I, I, you got to be, the guy had to be crazy. And he's like, well, I don't know what it could be then. Well, he, he, uh, my mom told me a story that happened to him before I was born. They were coming through Arkansas. They had family in, in Arkansas. And, uh, him and my mom and my uncle and his wife were in a car. It was about midnight. And they saw something on the side of the road with red. He, she said it had red eyes. They all saw it. And then about a half mile later, this guy come running down the road out of the driveway, hollered, and it scared them. And they, they just took off. And uh, so I asked him about that. And he's like, man, I don't know what it was. I, unless I have evidence. I said, Dad, man, well, I don't know what kind of evidence you want to be dead. You wanted to kill somebody, and then you'll know. Because I don't I, – this thing here, man, he's – he uh, uh, He's not scared of anything. My dad, he's the bravest guy I know, and he was scared. And that's why I, said, I don't know what it takes for him. And and that, and that's what's always frustrated me, Wes, is if my own dad, who was there, has a hard time believing, ain't nobody I tell believe a word I say. They think I'm just making up. I'm telling you, I'm. I, what's in it for me? I, it, it destroys my credibility with most people if I tell them they think you're crazy or put on. I said, I don't drink. I've never drank. I don't smoke. I don't do anything wrong. I have no reason in the world to lie. There's no reason for me to make a story up. And especially with my wife there, you think, I, I tell everybody, you think I'm honest, my wife, she wouldn't lie for nothing. For $10 million, she wouldn't tell a little white lie. She'll tell you. She'll, she'll say it had to be something, but she's not sure. Sometimes she'll say it's a bear. I said, honey, we don't have bear. There's no there's no black bear there. I'm not, There's no black bear where we were. Yeah. And there's bears, nothing there that big. <laughs> and bears don't throw rocks. You know, that's the yeah, other thing. That's awesome. but, yeah. yeah, I think, and, and, to be honest with you, Georgia, I think that uh, a lot of people have that mindset like your dad or your wife. Um, and I don't blame them for having that mindset. I think sometimes it's easier to process it going, it must have been a bear. It must have been a guy up on the hill. It must have been this. It yeah. must have been that. Because B- Bigfoot is the last thing you want to admit you've seen, you know, it's yeah, because uh, it changes, you know, are you going to go fishing now in that same area? A lot of people, they, yeah. they won't, they won't go fishing. Well, I don't go at night. I'll go, I'll go early in the morning, but I won't go at night. Nope. Yeah. I, I honestly think my own personal opinion and, and you, you know, better cause you were there. I kind of think it wanted the fish, although it's pretty aggressive to step out in the open the way it did. I wanted to ask you two questions. One, yeah. do you, do you feel like, uh, I know in the email you felt like you were in danger and that it – do you feel like it wanted you guys or that it was uh, going to harm you? I felt I, I felt like it wanted something, and it was at uh, – because at first we didn't see – we didn't see anything, just rocks. And so when this thing came out, like you said, that's the first thing I thought. If it's going to show itself in the open, it means business. It, it's not there – I felt like it felt. I felt like it was playtime was over. I tried to warn y'all to get out of here with these rocks. Y'all didn't want to do it. I'm trying to yell at you, and you don't want to do it. So I don't know if it was after. Uh, it didn't chase us though, because we got back to the car. It, it would have caught us nothing. It, it wasn't that big of a hill, you know. It was twenty. It, I mean, it's a big hill, but he could have got down the hill easy and got us. It, or it, she, I say he, she could have got down and got us easy, easy, easy. So it didn't. I, I think it was after the fish, after I got out of there. But it's just, it was just the way it swayed and gestured. It, it, it kind of brought its arms up, and it was scary. I don't know if it. it I don't know. I, I don't think it was after us. After I thought about it, because it would have got us if it wanted us. Yeah, a lot I of think times it was after the fish. Yeah, a lot of times it's scare tactics. But you know, you've seen how big these things are. I mean, it's not hard yeah. to scare a human away just based oh, on no. their size and. Um, you know, they're not the prettiest things to look at either. So yeah. no, I was going to say, the other thing was, I always thought there was a smell. I didn't smell anything either. But like you said, it, it just standing up would have scared me as big as it was. Yeah. The, the it didn't smell. have to do all the other stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now the, the smell, you know, rarely do I ever, people ever mention the smell. I mean, it's very rare. Yeah. Uh, it does happen. And people generally describe the smell the same, but a lot of times there is no smell. Yeah. Um, when it was throwing rocks at you, how big were the rocks? Were they just small pebbles or just little? Uh, no, probably about a quarter inch around. They uh, they weren't big. Now the the one that uh, made us run the first time was uh, probably about the size of a softball. They had different size rocks. The big rocks were on the bottom, and then it kind of got smaller gravel up toward the top. So I think it was yeah, it wasn't big rocks. It, like when the rocks were hit me, I, I could they hit you, but it didn't hurt. It wasn't like it was hurting or anything. I, I wasn't afraid that the rock was going to hurt me. 
it just was kind of annoying. You know, it's kind of scary is what it was because you didn't know what it was coming. It's scary more than hurt. Yeah, no, so, I, I can imagine. Did did all of the rocks come from that direction? Did, yep, you remember? from that same area, yep. Every one of them was, and it only threw, if you were over, it threw it. My uncle, three or four times, he said it, it threw it. My cousin, the, my cousin said it started earlier, but he thought it was just us, and he was just trying to ignore us so we, we wouldn't get the glory of trying to scare him. But it only threw rocks when you were over down the bank. About It was about 15 yards up the bank uh, where the stringer was with the with the fish and we were catching fish. let me tell you something we were catching fish that stringer was full it, it, we were fixing to start a second str- stringer catfish and so but the only time it threw rocks is when we were down by the stringer so yeah. let me ask you this george and i really appreciate you sharing the encounter yeah. uh what do you think sasquatch is and, and you've heard me ask other people there's yeah, no, yeah. no wrong answer of course <laughs> well to me uh, this one seemed like an animal it just seemed like an animal the way it acted so the stories i've heard uh, that my grandma told me it makes it seem more like a, like a animal. So, but I, Wes, I, if you got a, a quick second, I'll tell you uh, something else that happened. Yeah, I don't know if it has to do with Sasquatch, but I've heard y'all talk about infrasound. And the only reason I bring this up is I don't know about that. I, I this thing that, that was up there was an animal, the thing I saw, but uh, we go fishing where, where that Brown Springs happened is uh, the little area. There's called love's Valley. It's right on the Red River. We fit, that's a that's a when you're in Texas, you get a Texas home fishing license. You can fish from I-35 on the Red River East. You're legal. So we go fishing there a lot because there's a lot of big fish in there. And uh, the my, uh, this infrasound thing happened before the Bigfoot the Bigfoot encounter. It, uh, my wife wasn't with us. We were still dating at the time. This time, but me and my uncle, my dad, my brother, a bunch of us had gone and parked and. It's about a probably about a hundred and fifty yards from where you park to get to the river. And that night when we got out, it was quiet. It was a weird, eerie feeling. And we started walking to the river and we walked in circles four or five times and never made it to the river. We were out there for almost three hours trying to get to the river. And it got so bad that uh, our fishing line, my uncle started carrying the pole. We taking turns carrying the equipment because it's a long walk. You, and we got a lot of, uh, tackle and bait and, and all the string had come out of our poles from getting hung on trees and we would come back around to the same exact place we walked in circles and circles and circles never done it since never done it before but that one night we did and when we got back to the car everybody was dizzy almost like you almost like a my dad was say, he, he kept saying he thought there was a natural gas leak or something down there but i didn't smell any natural gas because we were all dizzy and we had walked in circles for two and a half, three hours, and never made it to the Red River. And it, and it's weird. We, we, it's just a straight walk. It's not that complicated. So I don't know. I don't know what happened that night. But And I never knew what happened because I saw listening to your show and heard stuff like that. And I'm, I'm like, man, what, mate? I don't know if that's what happened. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Yeah, but I've never seen strange lights or anything like that. But it, that night was weird, man. Yeah, it sounds and, like it. You know, and it's strange because I've, I've heard other people talk about that where they are – hiking or they're hunting and they've been on the trail many times and they end up going in circles and a lot of times they'll leave and then they're disoriented. And I don't really have an answer for that. I don't know if that's infrasound or if there's something else going on there, but that's not a unique, it's not a unique experience, Georgie. I've heard it many times. It feels unique though. And and we didn't ever hear anything and I never felt anything. We never heard anything following us or anything like that, but I, I try to explain that to people, and they think crazy. It sounds crazy to me. I'm telling you, if you saw it, it, it would sound crazy. It does sound crazy, but I don't know what happened. I really don't. And my dad, uh, like I said, he thought it was maybe somebody had, had broken a natural pa- gas pipeline, and we got it. We breathed too much fumes. I don't know. I didn't feel weird after we left. After we after we drove out of there and got home, I didn't have a headache or anything like that. But but when we got back to the car, man, we were all dizzy and disoriented. So I don't know. I don't know if I had anything to do with it or not, but it, it's all this stuff that I'm telling you is all happened within a little 15, 20 mile range right there together. And there's, and it's all connected. It's still connected by uh, the river bottom woods. Not super thick, but still there. <laughs> yeah. So well, be, be careful when you're out there. You know, it's, oh, yeah. I think a lot of times with these sayings, I think if you stand your ground, like if you guys would have stayed there, I, I don't know. I, you know, so I, I would like to think it would back off. It would eventually back yeah. off. But 
again, in this situation, for it to come out in the open, that you're right, that is ramping up the aggression. You know, it's it's willing to step out in the open, and especially a female, uh, because yeah. a lot of times they don't. Um, not always. Yeah. I, I've heard of other times when they do step out in the open, but generally it's the male. It's the big male that's going to step yeah. out and make you run, you know, make you leave. Um, wh- when it was vocalizing to you, was it just grunting? Is that all you heard? Was it grunting? It, it was a, it was a, a low grunt. And, uh, uh, yeah, that's all it did. It was grunting. It sounded kind of like, it sounded like, a like you would make fun of a, of a gorilla or something, that kind of a noise. It never got really loud. It was deep. I mean, you could feel it, but, uh, yeah, it wasn't super loud. It, it, it was real short burst of grunt. And it was, it was, a. Uh, turn his head as we ran as we started when they took off running his eyes followed them and so i started running and i looked up and it and it was looking at me still making a grunt noise and uh i could hear it grunting as i was running but uh it, it and then it just quit grunting and, and i didn't look back so i was too scared to look back and once we got to the truck and looked back i never heard it again and we didn't see it I don't know. I don't know if they got the fish. Like I said, we left everything. My um, my dad said, there ain't nothing worth dying for over there. We can't replace them. We didn't want to take a chance. Cause they, and I asked everybody, and we all felt like it was a life or death situation. I yeah, don't know if it was or not, but I wouldn't go find out. Well, a lot of times if you go with your gut in these situations, usually your gut's right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Your first type yeah. feeling is usually right in situations like this. Yeah. And, and uh, like I said, when I was uh, – Eight, nine, ten years old, me and my cousins would walk through the woods all night long and never be scared. I never was scared. I'd be scared like if I step on a snake or something, but not scared for my life like that. So, and, and you know, it's, it's, and boy, I am now, though. I, I, I'm nervous when I get out there. If it starts getting dark, I don't I don't stay at night anymore. We, and, like, and, like, and like you said, the whole thing about it is, Wes, the thing that really upsets me is the fact that now I know it's there. And, and that's what scares me. Even if it's not there in my mind, it's, it could be there. And it's changed everything for me as far as how I feel out there anymore. Yeah. I'm not going out there. Yeah, I can imagine, you know, and, and the other thing too, um, I think a lot of times when you step out in the woods and you get that feeling that you were talking about in the beginning, like yeah. you're being watched, the world isn't right. Something's wrong. A lot of times just turn around and, and go back the way you came because yeah. Oh yeah. The, you, you're, your brain, I, I think our brains. Well, I don't want to get into that, but I think yeah. we can for we can see these things, we can react to them before we actually physically see them. Yeah, and I think yeah, that's that, what that, you were experiencing. You know? Oh yeah. Well, I've got that way. I know what you're talking about. I can feel that way when we go fishing. Sometimes I just know I got a feeling we're gonna catch these fish today, and we're where to fish. And uh, like I said, we go to the we go to the cabins every year, at least once a year, with the family to to Beaver's Bend at Southeast Oklahoma. It's right around the corner from Hanobi. We, we we actually went to the Bigfoot Festival this year. We we went in October. I had an extra week of vacation, and we all went. And uh, when we got there, they, it, there was a sign, Hanobi uh, Bigfoot Festival. So we just went for the fun of it. And and to be honest with you, Wes, I don't feel scared out there at all. And I know they said that that's where that attack happened, but I don't get that same feeling there. And I hope I don't ever get that feeling there. But I, I still get a little bit leery at night going outside the – the cabins, but we'll, we'll sit around and listen to Sasquatch Chronicles or watch a, a, we got a projector and we hang up a big screen and we watch scary movies out around a campfire and it's no big deal. And I'm not scared. Not like I am where, where this happened. I'm still scared where this happened. Like I'm literally scared. Not, I, I, it's not a little bit of fear. It's like, I don't, I, I'm not going to do it over there. In my mind, I kind of, I hear stories. I'm like, well, I don't know. I don't know. But and then I'm, I'm thinking, well, I know that because I saw one, you know, it changes the way you think about everything, man. It does. I don't like it. It, it. it was. I wish it would have never happened. I honest to goodness wish it would have never happened because it's changed. It's changed my my area where I grew up. And played. It was my playground. You know. It's. I don't know. It was my safe spot because I grew up in in the city of Ardmore, and it's it's uh, one of the most dangerous cities in you know Oklahoma. And uh, you get nervous there going outside. Somebody's going to shoot you or rob you or something. So that was my safe place. And now it didn't feel safe anymore. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, now you know they're out there, you know, seeing is believing. And all those people that kind of laugh at you and put you off, you know, it's it's all fun and games until you run into one. And then (laughs) your whole mentality changes after you run into one. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. 
Well, everybody asks me now, do you go up there and look for them? I'm like, I'm not a scientist. I wouldn't know what to do. And I, and to be honest with you, I, I tell them I don't want to find one. I'm, I'm done with that. I, I like, I like telling the stories. Uh, with, with, like I said, we listen to it and, and scare the kids around the campfire, but I tell them, I, I thought I knew scared. I thought I was scared when my grandma told me them stories. And I thought, man, it'd be fun to find one of them things. And, and it was just not, not anything like what I thought. It's the opposite of what I thought. So Yeah, it usually yeah. is. Well, I appreciate you letting me talk to you, man. It's, it feels like I'm getting something off my chest because we've been sitting on this for a while, and, and I don't know who to tell. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's who you're scared to tell. I'm scared to tell anybody that think you're a nut. So that's all I told them. If, if I, what I do, and I mentor kids, and see, that's a, a, a stoke your ego a little bit, but I mentor kids that are in trouble. I've got a, I, I called this one kid my nephew. He's, he's a family friend that was about to go to prison, uh, drugs and gang activity. And I've, and, uh, I've kind of taken him under my wings. I do this with a bunch of kids and I take them to football games with me. But, uh, uh, the way I get their attention, cause they don't want to hear from an old man, you know, you don't know anything, but we'll go fishing or we'll go out, uh, on a little camping trip or something. I'll put on some Sasquatch Chronicles and I got their full attention. They like that. And so we'll start a lot of our th- things like that. We'll start out after fishing. They're all horsing around. I'll put on Sasquatch Chronicles and I'll be the only one fishing. They're all huddled around the radio listening. And then, uh, so then we start talking and it helps me to, it helps me to uh, kind of break the ice with these kids. And, and they're like, Hey man, we can go hang out. If you'll play those Sasquatch Chronicles, we, we'll go hang out with them. I'm like, all right. And so it's helping me, it's helped me build a relationship with these kids. That I'm trying to help. And they help me, they help keep me young, you know, these kids, but, uh, yeah, it helps a lot. So that part, that's, that's a really, <laughs> a lot of your, uh, a lot of your shows, that's how we, that's how we break the ice and get these kids in to listen. And they'll, and they'll start listening once they, cause they like, you know, they all like this, the scary boogeyman kind of a deal. But I tell them all the time, I, when I, they'll listen to your stuff and they'll listen to everybody on there and they'll believe them. And if I tell them about my encounter, all of a sudden, oh, you're crazy. I'm like, how in the world y'all going to call me crazy? I'm trying to tell you the truth, but it helps a lot. So we use your show a lot that way. I don't know if you ever thought it'd ever come to that, but that's that honest to goodness. That's what we do. <laughs> well, I appreciate it, man. Thank you very much for that. That's yeah. very nice of you. And, um, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show and, and share your encounter. It's a very fascinating encounter and it's interesting because I hear it all the time with fishermen. It's the same behavior yeah. over and over and over with when people are fishing and, uh, it is terrifying. You know, it is terrifying. Even if it doesn't kill you in the end of the day, it's still terrifying to run into one of these things. I don't care yeah. what anyone says, you know, yeah. it's, it's terrifying. And yeah. if you're not scared, there's something wrong with you. But <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> you, I tell them, you think you're a tough guy. Just come find this fella. <laughs> that dude's, ooh. but if you know what, it didn't kill me, but it killed a part of me. It killed, it killed that innocence I had in that woods. It, it really did. And sometimes I'm resentful that I'll, I'll be honest with you. I try not to live that way. And I try to forgive and forget and move on. But man, that thing has scared me to death. I bet. Yeah. I bet. Well, thank you again, Georgia. I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you calling me back. Sorry it was such a hassle getting in there. I'm figuring this email and phone and all that stuff out. So uh, no <laughs> I apologies. appreciate the patience with me. <laughs> yeah, no apologies. All right, brother. One time. Do you think it was a person? Do you think that was a person? I don't know. I think it was. I mean, it might have been. I'm like shaking right now. Okay. That scared me. I don't know. Listen. I have to get it on tape. Holy God. Let's get out of here. Oh, 
That was quite the uh, the audio. I want to welcome uh, Denise to the show. Denise, thanks for coming on. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate you being here. Uh, before we actually go into what's going on on your property, because I, I, as you and I were talking last night, I was just, I don't know what the word is, enthusiastic to talk to you after hearing about what you saw in the face and how you described the face and what's going on in your property. Uh, before we get into that, would you talk a little bit about this audio? What were you guys doing and where were you guys at? How how did you get this audio? Well, I'll tell you, we live um, outside of the Sam Houston National Forest. And the day that we recorded that audio was the first time we had ever went hiking in the Sam Houston National Forest on the Lone Star Hiking Trail. And in fact, it was not a day that I think anyone would choose to go out for a hike. It was Super Bowl Sunday of 2012, I believe. And we had had some yucky, yucky weather. And the kids were just climbing the walls, needing an outing. And it was kind of had been drizzling and close to freezing for a couple of days off and on before that. And I just told them, you know what, you want to get out of the house, we'll bundle up, put some boots on, and we'll go walking out there. So everybody was excited to go and check out the trail. And it was very, very quiet out there. I think everybody was at home watching football, having parties, and we were out in the middle of the woods by ourselves, which didn't bother us at first. We were, we were fine. So we enjoyed the hike. There were a couple of strange things that happened. Looking back on it now, maybe I should have paid more attention. Um, we were probably about a quarter of a way in, on our way into the trail, and I heard what sounded like rain pouring down in one spot behind me. And as I turned around to look, it was a big tree that had been shaking, apparently, that had been damp from the rain that had been, it it had rained the day before and earlier that day. So apparently the leaves still had a lot of, you know, drops on them. And I, I saw the very, when I turned around, the tree was just stopping as it had been being shook back and forth. And I remember thinking that is the weirdest thing. There was no wind out of there, but you know, you just kind of carry on and, of course, think, oh, it's just one of those freak things that happen to you. And then a little while later, I know my son stopped and said, do you hear that? And he claims that he heard what sounded like some people talking out in the woods, or maybe he said laughing. He couldn't quite make out what was going on. But that was just another thing that we thought, oh, you know, who knows, maybe somebody way over there. Well, and we walked about two miles on the trail, and we were around Stubblefield Lake area. And I reminded everybody we soon had to stop and turn around and make that same walk back. Don't get too tired. And we stopped for a minute scooped around, and about this time, I believe the show, Finding Bigfoot, had just started or hadn't been on for too long, and we were kind of goofing around, going, okay, will you do this person's call, and we really were just having fun with it, never expected anything like we got back. And then as we all took a turn, so the four of us had all yelled and been making noise and when my nephew who was 15 at the time when he did the last one something very close to us in the wood line yelled out back at us similar what you heard on the recording except the first one we weren't prepared for so we didn't get to record it but that one was very very close in a different spot coming at us you know, enough to startle us, spook us. And I know that my nephew's eyes got really big and he said, tell them not to run. Well, the little ones did. They kind of started to go and then we got them back and the recording starts as I try to hit record on our device. 
and I ask him to do it again, which he's not too enthusiastic about, but he does do it as we're shuffling ourselves back down to the car. Yeah, and the vocals that you got were just, um, I mean, and I've heard that out, out of Stubblefield, <laughs> unfortunately. A lot of people that in Texas, I'm like, hey, if you want to hear him, if you want to see him, go to Stubblefield, because uh, after midnight, it it really is like Jurassic Park out there, you know what I mean? Yes. Well, I don't think I'd ever be brave enough to ever go out there after the sun goes down. Now, the weirdest thing about that, and it sounds funny to say, is I I don't feel that the noise or the sound, the yells, howls, whatever we call them, I didn't feel like it was coming at us as a, you got to get out of here. I almost feel like whatever it was, was almost hollering because we did. We never had weird vibes on the way out there. And I could be just, you know, totally misreading the situation. But we didn't have anything else happen except after we did it, it answered back. And let me say this, there was more than one out there because the one that is first on the audio, that howl or yell comes from a total different direction further away. So that disturbs me, of course, to know that, you know, whatever shook the tree behind me, there was probably one back there after learning more about them. And then whoever my son might have heard if that had anything to do with it. So I can't say for sure what the intention was, but I didn't get the feeling even when I heard it that it was, you know, in a harmful type way. I almost feel like I was kind of shocked that whatever this was, was trying to join in on what we were doing, so to speak. But the other interesting thing about that trip is right when we stepped off the trail and got into the parking lot, I clearly heard what sounded like a gorilla beating its chest. It was a very hollow rhythmic sound that I have only heard watching shows like on National Geographic. I mean, I live in East Texas. I know what the woodpeckers sound like and things like it was a different type of, it's almost hard to explain, but you know what I'm talking about, that sound that you've heard. It's almost like a hollow something. When I heard that and we were already in the parking lot, I remember thinking, Maybe I misread the situation. Whatever it was, I was picturing it almost saying, well, good, y'all are out of my turf. Yeah, it could be. If that makes any sense. Yeah, it does make sense. You know, but it was really weird the way we were almost back at our car when I heard that. So I'm just glad we were very lucky that we didn't have any trouble while we were in there except that. But it was an interesting thing to be able to record for sure. No, yeah, very interesting. And, you know, like I said, I've I've told many witnesses in the past, a lot of times if you go with your gut feeling, 99.9% of the time you're right. Uh, If you think they want to harm you and that's the way you feel, you're probably right. If you're in a situation where you don't think there's harm, you're probably right. And so you guys get back to the car, you guys leave, and uh, I would imagine that was a fun trip home talking about, oh, my God, you know, because you got great audio. I mean, you got some of of the best audio I've heard. (laughs) Oh, really? Well, I'll tell you, I did, and there's probably going to be a park ranger listening to me and going to hear that I took the mile marker with me that I passed because I joked with the kids and said, I am taking this with me because this is the day I'll always remember. (laughs) I found out Bigfoot was real. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But, um, yeah, and it it kind of started making me look into other things about Sasquatch that I didn't know before, which actually some of the events I had been going through for so many years in the past came to mind. And I started putting things together that, you know, I knew were odd and I carried them with me as always looking back and going, that was really odd or off or creepy. And now it, it kind of put more things together for me, the puzzle, so to speak. Well, let's talk about that because you have a very interesting property, and I want you to be very vague about where your property's at. Okay. And so if you would, would you kind of talk – would you talk about the things that happen around your property 
and walk us into eventually yeah. seeing this creature because your descriptions of the face I've heard before off the air. I don't know that I've ever had anyone on the air describe what you've seen. Uh, so if you would, would mm. you kind of give us a history of this property, what was going on, and then walk us into when you actually saw them. Okay. Um, well, I'll just say this. Um, we've lived on, I, we moved to this property when I was a year old. So I've, we've always, I've always ended up coming back home. And I, even when I've moved off for a while, but I'm very familiar with it and what's normal and what's not. And even though we live in an area to where our backyard area opens up to a set of woods, and then it has a rural high line back there. But it actually, if you were to follow the woods behind my home parallel down, you know, so many miles within less than, what, six, seven miles, you pretty much run into the Sam Houston National Forest. And I would say the first thing that I remember that I always remembered as being very, very odd is I had a neighbor. And this was one thing I didn't get to mention to you. But this always bothered me because we had never had people back behind our home. I mean, we just, I don't think I ever saw one person except for someone in our household that walked in the woods back there. It was just in, in almost 40 years. So my neighbor was getting older and her husband had passed away. And we all had these little gates that went from our backyard to the Woods Highline area. We used to, you know, use it to th use it to take leaves and pile up in the woods. You know, anything we needed to get to the woods, we all had this little gate. And she used to keep a big garden each year. And she was getting older, and I'm sure her eyesight wasn't perfect. But I remember she started talking about, "Do you know that I had to go and get new curtains for my back windows? There is an extremely large." black man that has been coming occasionally and staring in my back windows by the garden. Well, at first, I, I never was alarmed. I was more puzzled because I thought that is so not normal where we are. You know, it just doesn't happen. And, and she said it one time, and then I think it was about a year later when we were talking, she brought it up again to the point that she wanted to take her little back gate out back there so it wouldn't be so accessible to the woods. I can't say for sure if that was linked, but it always stuck with me and was odd to all the other people, my family members that I would, you know, mention it to, they'd say, really? Well, I would say when I started walking the trail more to the high line, with the kids and I came across one day there we just walked out of the woods and on the woods line was a large and when I say large this was probably a 400 pound pink domestic pig that was laying there in the woods line and it didn't have any injuries except there was a small almost straight incision in its lower part of its stomach and its intestines or I don't know if anything else was removed. I wouldn't be able to tell you that. But its intestines were piled up in a little pile beside it. And it was just laying there. And, it, and we, after all these years of living here, I'm sure we had a wild boar that might have traveled through. But it wasn't a normal place that you would even see those. So to see this thing dead here like this was very odd. There's no way for anybody to come in and dump it where it is. It was just really out of place. So that always stuck with me. I never quite understood, but I will later on tell you that I found something um, similar to it in the National Forest. So that it kind of linked it together for me. But after that, things started happening with noises. Um, one night in particular, it wasn't directly in the woods directly behind us, but maybe down a little bit enough to where I could hear it, there was what I would call a lion's roar back there one night. I can't say whatever the vocal was. 
started as a roar, but when it finished, it sounded just like the roar of a lion. And I was always wondering what that was. Now, I've never heard a mountain lion before. I, I, one thing we've never seen back there is we've never seen a bobcat behind our house. So you initially always just want to chalk it up to, oh, it's probably this. Don't worry about it. And we used to hear the next thing I remember is I'd have company come over and we'd all be outside after dark. And if people were talking and telling a story, Somebody might have gotten dramatic and said, boy, and make a whistling sound. It sure was hot today. Well, within 10 or 15 seconds, the wood line was maybe, what, 150 feet, 200 feet behind my backyard. You would hear a whistle, this loud, sharp, crisp whistle that you could swear was a person, but it didn't sound like a person, if that makes sense. Yeah. The other thing, I'll never forget, my son would be out playing in the backyard. I remember one time, and it really was kind of surprising and shocking, is it was starting to get dark. We were in the backyard, and he had a wooden sword in his hand, and he was kind of swinging it around while I was doing something, and he accidentally, you know, had it bang into his wooden swing set, which I guess it did sound like what people call a wood knock. And within five seconds, a wood knock came out of the the woods right behind the house, but you couldn't see anybody. It was always those type of things. And I would say the first time that I really knew something really different, creepy, odd was, (laughs) was back there is I was going back to check our bird bath in an area right behind the fence uh, by the woods lawn that um, we used to feed the squirrels and the birds and had a bird bath back there. Um, I, I went back one afternoon and just a real pretty afternoon and I opened the gate and I must have been fairly quiet is all I can think of in the beginning because I had been working the cleaning out the bird bath, refilling it for about a, maybe about two or three minutes whenever I had a bag that was almost finished of Cheetos and I was going to throw them away in the trash can. And I decided, no, I'll just crumple up the crumbs and throw them out here for the little animals. And when I did that, I I must have crumpled the bag quickly and loudly, but something that must have been low to the ground is all I can say. I picture something might've been resting there because I did not see anything at the time Um, and this grass area that it came out of was maybe about 30 feet from me on my right hand side when I made that noise I pictured that I startled it Um, I crumpled up that bag loudly and something shook this tree so violently back and forth and made this sound I will never be able to explain or forget because it was so high-pitched as a screech or a squeal and so loud that it sounded like some sort of factory is all I could think of at the time. Something that a machine would do. I don't think an animal, a person, (laughs) could make a noise like this. Uh, And I just flew. I, I mean, just took off because I wasn't even staying around to find out what it was. But I know that event scared me so badly that I didn't go back behind the fence for probably about a year. It was almost like it became crippling. It scared me so bad. It sounds silly, but I was that afraid. But over time, that kind of heals things and things become normal again. I you know, I started living life as normal and walking around, taking care of everything, didn't matter where it was. No events, I should say, had happened for a good long time, so I was able to go back to normal. And um, one night, I can remember, we heard some rustling out. It had already been dark. I'm thinking it was probably about 9 or 10 at night, and we have a above-ground pool. It's a large oval one, and we had built this big um, 
It was four foot high, like the pool, a big, large wooden deck that was right up against the cyclone fence line. So if you were standing on the pool deck and looking down, you'd be looking pretty much over the fence towards the back woods. Well, we had a couple of little bushes or some brush that had grown back there. And I know that that's something that got my attention to where I was going to investigate it. And I had went and got a big plastic type flashlight and walked out there and started shining it in different places on the ground, looking around. And um, I walked up the deck. So I was actually leaning over the fence line at this point with my flashlight. And the light went out on me. And out of reaction, I picked it up and shook it back and forth, you know, those old plastic flashlights. And I shook it back and forth, and it made this loud rattling noise to where something that was, I'm picturing squatting or sitting because it went from a position of on the ground and it came straight up. I don't know if it stood all the way up because I think right about the time we were face to face with each other or where his face, his or her face would be, um, it moved so quickly that I knew it wasn't a person. We had a cedar branch. I went and measured afterwards. It was about five, five and a half feet off the ground. Whatever it was came up and I saw the cedar branch move. And then it was down so quickly. And and I, I was gone at the same time. So I don't know if it left. I'm assuming it did because I got the feeling that we surprised each other or if that's just the reaction I got from it. But I couldn't see any detail except you could tell it was a round head, a dark, and it was all a uniformed black, like a shadow almost. I probably could have seen more if it wasn't able to move so quickly and quietly because this was, I remember, fall time, and we have a lot of trees. I don't know if sometimes you don't hear the noise because you're shocked and you're paying attention to I'm getting out of here or what's going on. I don't know if I just didn't hear it, but whatever it was, was too quick to be a person. And no other animal could come and stand upright like that and then squat back down so quickly or at all if it didn't, you know, if it wasn't a biped, so to speak. Let me ask you, before you go on, um, what do you think is going on at this point? Are you thinking these woods are haunted or you got a lion back there? I mean, what's kind of going through your mindset at this point? You know, I I will say that I've I've actually thought about this because I've heard you ask other people (laughs) on the show before. And I thought, wow, that's going to really make, you know, it sounds like something that you should have been thinking about. I think it's natural reaction when you live someplace and you've never really, we had weird issues, but we never really felt threatened or alarmed. Now this, I will say until the tree shaking, I think I just chalked it up to, it was one of those weird things in life you can't explain. You know, like, like there's how, I don't think I'll ever know an answer. We didn't get to see it. I never had any type of paranormal paranormal experiences myself. So I, I'm not quick to go there. I, it's not that I don't believe. I just yeah. haven't had any experiences myself. So I don't think that crossed my mind. I do think about this time. I walked away or ran away from that pool deck that night, and I pretty much knew down deep what I thought it was. Now, was I going to tell anybody? Mm, maybe a few people, but I wasn't really going to announce it, so to speak. No, I understand. I would say what really, really got me was we used to have so many kind of odd things happen that I had a pair of binoculars that I used to keep in the kitchen area. And I was coming through the kitchen one evening and um, I noticed something looked like it moved a little bit, but I didn't see anything. And I picked up the binoculars and I started to look out the window. Well, I purposely did not put the kitchen light on. I was trying to not, you know, to get a good look first. And um, I picked them up and looked out and I can't believe 
what I saw behind this tree. And it took me a few minutes to figure it out what I was looking at because it was just a face and sticking out the actually the left profile of some type of face coming out from behind this tree. And let me say the tree is only about 200 feet at the most from where I was. So having binoculars, you you can get a pretty good look. Well, what? let me say this. What I thought I saw at first, because I had to put the binoculars down and look two or three times, what I thought I saw at first, what reminded you of a black gorilla, like a gorilla would look, but not exactly. Um, I put the binoculars down for a second and I thought, wow, you are really seeing things, you know, and I gave myself a second, decided, let's try this again. It probably won't be there. Well, I looked through again and there it was. But what caught my attention was actually the white teeth had actually caught my attention first. But when I first saw it, it was, it was, had a facial expression and I, only can compare it to I've seen my cat do this only a few times before when it has been out trying to smell something it um, had its mouth open about maybe an inch to two inches where it looked like the nose had those muscles around the nose area had pulled up the upper lip just a little bit teeth were parted but I couldn't see the bottom teeth I could only see the top and because that's what I was shocked about and focused in on at first is it had um, it the teeth weren't together it was they were just a little bit apart and it was holding its mouth open not in a evil type look but almost in this natural way of me the way I've seen my cat do it's like I focused in and when it looks like it's like trying to smell something and I hope that makes sense but <laughs> Yeah, that does. But it did have um, canines that were not long, but that shocked me is I started looking at those and I thought they're like people, <laughs> you know, eye teeth, canine teeth, but longer, not tremendously long, just just a little bit more, enough to where you really notice they're there. And I did have to put the binoculars down again because I thought, okay, give this, but we're going to give this one more shot, even though I was pretty sure what's going on. And I must have moved too much to where I'm assuming it saw me at this point or saw something moving, even though I was inside the house. Because when I went to look again, I was able to see um, a different expression. And what I saw made my heart drop into my stomach because it had a smile on its face like the Joker is the first thing that came to mind. And it was it was looking at my way at first, and then it looked over for the longest time towards the tree line, which would have been opposite, but the facial expression of the smile. And when I say Joker smile... I think the reason it reminded me of that is because their mouth must be larger or wider than a human's. So when they go and pull up a smile, the, if, I'm trying to explain this where it makes sense, but it's almost like with the mouth being wider, the smile on each side goes higher. I did see the bottom teeth at this time because it was a teethy joker smile. And the nose, reminded me a lot of a gorilla's because the all I remember seeing is the nostrils. So they were very visible. And I, I don't think I got to, I don't think I paid attention too much more to the nose, but I think it was the eyes and the mouth that really, really got me because it was so strange and unsettling to me, especially the expression on its face. I didn't see any hair because it was just say the forehead to the chin. Um, I'm guessing that maybe um, it probably had a hairline that went a little bit further back for it to be able to poke around the tree like that, and I didn't see anything. But I'll tell you that the eyes are really 
really creepy too. And um, ugh, this is I, I even made the joke to a friend of mine. I said if um, if people saw <laughs> what I saw out in the woods, the people that went searching for Bigfoot would get a new hobby because it's not what you think it is. <laughs> but yeah, um, no, it's not. Oh, I'm get. I know I'm getting a little choked up now. You can hear this. <clears throat> okay, so. They do have whites in their eyes, but what I think is the issue is I think they're set a little bit different. Either they are set a little bit further out, like they they aren't so set back in their heads the same as humans. And this is, I'll tell you the reason I'm saying it is because when it looked towards the tree line, I was on the other side. It looked weird. It looked like there was a lot of white showing at this time. And I'm going to give you probably a bad example, but I have a little chihuahua and his eyes are set just a little bit further out. And so I'm picturing I was able to see more of the white when they look to the side because you're able to see more on their eyes. Does that make any sense at all? (laughs) That does make sense. Yeah. Yeah, it does make sense. It's interesting, too, you say about the, um, jo- and I didn't mean to cut you off, but the Joker smile. I've heard that before from other witnesses. Um, I had a guy in North really? Carolina tell me the exact same thing. He said, it smiled at me. And I said, it smiled at you. And he goes, yeah, like the Joker. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, the mouth is so big. When it actually, he goes, I don't know if it was smiling. It looked like a smile. Uh, it reminded him of the Joker. And I, when you said that to me last night, I about fell out of my chair because I, and that's not the only time I've heard it. I've heard it other times, mm-hmm. but I, I didn't mean to cut you off, Denise. Oh, no, no, you're fine. In fact, one thing I wanted you to know is that particular uh, sighting, I never remembered. I, I mean, I remembered it, but I purposely didn't pay attention to it. And I'm going to tell you why. This is way before I had ever heard your show and had talked to other people. I'm not talked, heard other people that had had encounters. I thought they all looked like a cartoon character, Harry and the Hendersons kind of thing. And I didn't know much about them. So I had really walked away from a lot of this thinking it's in your head. It has to be. And I never told anyone until recent time about the one that I saw the face of behind the tree. First off, I wasn't going to tell my family because I didn't want them to think I was crazy and or if they believed me, I didn't want to make them afraid. But I actually blew it off and I went forward in life discounting it. And it was when I heard one one of the first shows I listened to about a month ago um, of yours. I think it was an early show. And it was someone in Texas, and I think they're part of an investigation group. And it was when he was a little boy, and he said it smiled at him through a window. And, or, or maybe, maybe this is the one where he, the thing waved its hand and was smiling to him, like to come towards him. And I never will forget that moment. I, something hit me, and I went, Oh my God. I can't believe it. That was real. And of course it had to be real. You know, people don't go into like three, you know, three minute psychotic events and then bounce out of it and live normal lives that yeah. often. But to me, I couldn't process it. You know what I mean? So I had to just go, you really must be seeing things. <laughs> but when I heard that is when I thought, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. And then at the same time, I was kind of sick to my stomach because I thought, well, I would have rather thought it wasn't true. If that makes any sense. Yeah, it does make sense. I think that's a normal human reaction for most people is to try and write it off or say, well, it must have been a bear. Or it must have been this. or my. I think that's a normal human reaction that we all go through when we've seen this thing. So this thing's turning and looking, obviously, at probably another creature. W- what happens next? At some point, it stays, it just stays still in that position. In fact, I decided to be the one to put the binoculars down. Now, now going back, of course, I wish I had gotten a chair and sat there and watched it for longer than I did. But I, what I actually thought was the strangest is I also couldn't believe that it was real, that it was just standing there. 
for minutes and minutes on end with that same creepy smile on its face. I didn't, I didn't know anything about them. I didn't know that they would stay in so still like a statue and watch people. But at some point, I just put them down after looking for a while and walked away. And I'll tell you this, that was the last night I ever put those binoculars by the window and looked out again. That was it. You know, I was done. I was done looking for things, so to speak. I guess looking back, you know, it, it's, you know, you, I would imagine some of the pieces start to come together of the puzzle of like, oh, that's what that roar was. Oh, that's what that tree shaking was. Oh, yes. that's what I think as humans, it's hard for us when something isn't supposed to exist. Monsters aren't real, right? And then all of a sudden you find out monsters are real. It's kind of, um, I think our brains go through a weird reset of trying to protect yes. ourselves from what we've seen and and what we've experienced. Was this the only time you had seen the creatures on the property? Uh, yes, the, the the times that we've had here. I've seen um, a couple of weird things have happened when we've been out on the Lone Star Trail, but those were the three times that I've ever had either sightings or things go on that I've seen them. You know what I mean? I, there's been a lot of strange things to where you're questioning and um, one of them that really threw me off that looped me back around to what happened to that big pig out there in our woods line is we were walking the Lone Star Trail one day and I noticed something pulled up under um, like a little bitty game trail went off to the side of it and something caught my attention and we walked down a little bit and up kind of tucked under some large brush was a dog. But what caught my attention is there was a very crudely built, what looked kind of like a teepee structure, uh, maybe about two foot tall, was put over this dead, it looked like a white German shepherd mix. And um, as I was taking the scene in, it was a I think late September, early October day in Texas, I noticed right away there wasn't a smell. So something, this was, um, the dog died recently. And the back legs, the only thing visible that was wrong with this dog is the back legs, I guess, trying to remember, I think it's where the hawk was or a little higher, had been twisted and broke and the bone was exposed on both back legs. That was the only visible injury on this on this poor dog. Now the stomach, the same thing had happened that happened to that pig. There was some something had cut the lower part of the stomach, and there were the intestines. Some a lot of the intestines laying over beside the animal, and on top of it was some weirdly constructed little teepee thing to where you could, you know, stand out. And I mean, it probably had about seven, seven branches logs that were a pretty good size though, you know, in diameter, they were inches. It's not like a little raccoon could come over and build this thing. But again, you know, um, that was one of those things that we looked and I did look around the animal's neck right away because I thought, oh, gosh, was this a cougar or something out here? And the little dog, bless its heart, had a bandana on, a faded bandana. So it was somebody's pet. But there was no other signs or injuries except the broken legs and then whatever had gotten to the to the stomach afterwards. But that was kind of something that really bothered me and stuck with me because I don't feel it it was a human that did that. For some reason, I walked away and was just, that was just one of those things I couldn't explain. Have you ever heard of anything like that before? I have. Yeah, I have. Um, I had a hunter one time who, around his property, he was having a lot of activity and he kind of describes this crude teepee structure that he found. And within the teepee structure was a fox and the same type of thing. He said the they had ripped the guts out, set the guts next to it. And he goes, I don't think this was a poacher. He goes, the legs were broken. It's very similar to what you're describing. But it was in this weird little crude teepee structure. 
And he had, you know, he's mm-hmm. like, there's no one out here. I'm the only one out here on this property that I know of. And but so I have heard that before. And it's very, uh, it makes you wonder what what's going on here. Is it a kill that they're protecting or they're going to come back and eat later? Mm-hmm. Very I know. I wondered the same thing. Yes. It just, it just always stayed with me. And it is true, though, I think. You follow your gut, your gut's usually right on things. Most of the things that I've seen or have had happened that right away I thought were odd, you know, those were things that after I gained more information, you know, they made sense to me. I'll tell you another thing that I didn't see, but this was so strange is one night I was outside and I used to be a smoker. So that's why I go outside sometimes up until midnight and and hear different things. But there was one night, I don't know if you remember, um, I think when I was little, they used to have these little wooden train whistles. I don't know if you're, they had a a unique sound to them. They were kind of loud, but kind of crisp. And um, I was standing outside and all of a sudden, this strange whistle started and it was down, you know, to my right. If I'm looking towards the wood, it was to my right. And this whistle, very loud, came from the woods and another one over to the side. You could tell they were in different places, a good bit apart from each other, but maybe parallel to each other. They made these sharp, loud, strange whistles. And the only thing I could think of is it sounds like they're they're on a mission or planning something together and they're using it for communication. But what was so weird is those woods are pretty thick unless you know them and know the trail. And within probably 20 seconds, they had whistled these weird whistles back and forth and made their way through my entire property line through those woods in the middle of the night. And I just remember thinking that is the weirdest thing. They, it didn't sound like a person, if that made sense. I just had to throw that in. No, no, I'm glad that you shared it. Um, I want That is odd. That is very odd. And they do make weird noises. I mean, I've heard all kinds of weird noises. You, know, you talked about the mechanical noise earlier. Uh, there's a guy I know that has these things on his property, and not far from his property is a warehouse. And he says out on his property, he will hear what sounds like a forklift backing up, you know, that beep, beep, beep. Oh, and he said, but goodness, it, it really? sa- yeah, but he said it sounds like a person's making that noise. It doesn't sound like a forklift. Uh, it's a good impression of one, but it's not exact. And so I think that they do mimic weird noises that they hear. And I think they communicate with just my opinion. I think they communicate with whistles and knocks and because uh, it's harder to track than yelling at someone, you know what I mean, than yelling back and forth to yeah. each other. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you, uh, I want to come back to this property and what else is going on there. Uh, but you ran into a weird looking dog. And I was kind of fascinated hearing this encounter. Would you mind telling everyone about that? <laughs> no, I, I, I kind of left that out at first because I thought maybe you'll ask me if you want to. I didn't know if I wanted to be known as the real crazy lady. <laughs> no, not <laughs> crazy at all. <laughs> Well, actually, what got me watching the woods so much was, you know, I don't just usually out of the clear blue leave binoculars by the window, but it was um, back some years ago, my mother was out cleaning our above ground pool. It was middle of the afternoon and it was a September day. We were getting ready to close it up and I had walked out the back door to tell her something. And as I walked out, I stopped because right across from us on the other side of the cyclone fence was a, I'm going to call it a canine type creature that I had never seen before and still haven't seen any on the internet that looked exactly like this one. But it um, would have reminded you of a deer from far away. Uh, It had a longer neck and longer legs, big kind of a roundish ear to it. But it was a dog. Um, it had the face of a dog and the muzzle, eyes and everything. But it would remind you of a deer-dog um, combination because it had a little bitty skinny rat-like tail, but it was completely hairless. Um, right away, 
um, I was looking at it and it reminded me of seal skin. It was like a purplish black in the sunlight kind of shiny. Well, I looked over at my mother and I said, is that what they call that chupacabra looking, you know, those chupacabra things? And we stood there and we both stared at it for about three or four minutes until I tried to approach a little bit more to get a picture. And it still didn't run the way a coyote and fox would do. Um, coyotes and fox come up behind our fence every once in a while and they're they're very panicky and very nervous creatures. If they were to hear a noise, it's a jump and they're looking and it's hard for them. This animal seemed to be a little bit more relaxed, kind of like a dog would be, but yet it wasn't your typical dog, if that makes any sense. So that's actually what got us watching more. And we started with the desire of what is this thing? And, of course, you'll have your people out there that say it's a mangy coyote. Here's the thing. When you grow up in an area for 40 years where seeing coyotes and fox are normal, you you know instantly when something's not normal. And this animal was shaped different than a coyote. Plus, its skin actually looked in good condition. I mean, it it had a she. It you could see it was kind of shiny looking and just this weird purple black. So I, we never quite found out what that was either. But you know, it was just one of those things that um, it, I just couldn't believe what we saw. We tried to look into that. You know, we researched that a little bit. We did put some game cams that um, and that what they're called trail cams, game cams up. And we got a few pictures of them and talked with a few other people. But interestingly enough, one of the first pics I got off this trail cam was um, what looked like a person. I thought it was. I guess I still wonder. But it was facing our highline area. And I flipped through them when I was reviewing them. And I said, oh, there's a person walking back in the high line at nighttime. And it was shocking to me because that just never happened. And the reason I saw it was because it's eye, of, of the eye shine, or at least I thought a person's eyes, you know, like if you were in an infrared light or, or something in, type of, in front of that type of camera. And it wasn't for a good bit of time later that I learned that people wouldn't show up like that on one. Yeah, not on a game cam. I understand what you mean, though. Like when you take a picture, yeah. sometimes you get that weird eye shine from someone with the flash, but not yeah. on a game cam, no. Yeah. Uh, fascinating. Yeah. I wonder what that thing was. And I hear people in Texas talk about it all the time. I don't know very much about it, but I'd like to know more about that strange creature that you saw. It is It is interesting. For a while, we it came around about once or twice a month. And that's when I kind of started watching it, but it really didn't fit any category. It, you know, it moves very cat-like. I went in all the way down to thinking, oh, did the government try to bring back the thylacine? Because some of them do have a weird stripe pattern on, on the back of them. Their tail is always really stiff, kind of like they use it for balance. But what's that all about? It is an interesting cryptid, though. Yeah, and I want to get into um, a couple other things. Before I get into that, is there anything else going on around the property? Has it died off or are they still around? Well, let me tell you, um, someone came and purchased some of the property behind us and um, thinned the woods out a little bit. And when that happened a couple of years ago, and they really thinned out a lot of the trees, they decided they wanted to put up a large fence. So actually, the woods down beside us, which aren't too far, I don't venture into them. But these days, I really don't know because the the property has changed some, if that makes any sense. So it's died down for me, <laughs> which I'm kind of happy about. But um, I've thought a couple of times about checking out this area next to us, which is you know, just across the street, the rest of the property that goes down into the National Forest. But then sometimes I think, yeah, let's leave that alone. (laughs) So it has gotten quiet. Well, good. That's a good thing. 
Um, I wanted to ask you about the the sheriff that shot one, and then the hand. Um, let's start. Oh, yes. Let's start with the hand that that uh, you guys found. Tell me about that. That's that's right. Well, it was one after one Sunday afternoon. I guess uh, probably towards the end when all of right before um, they came in and started thinning out the woods before it was was sold. Um, the kids went for a hike. This happened to be one of the times that I didn't go with them. And uh, they just went up into the back forest and started walking around. They were back about an hour later. And um, they come in to me and they tell me that they had gotten a little turned around, which they were kind of shocked about because they know the woods so much. And they said, oh, and while we were trying to find our way back, we found this. And they pull it out of their pocket. And right away, they call it a hand. And I look down and notice that, yes, it looks like a a part of a skeleton of a hand. Actually, it um, was some wrist bone. And it was the metacarpal. It wasn't the thumb. Now, the thumb was not attached. It was just the bones that go, some of the wrist bones, a good number of them, and then um, the bones that run from the wrist to your first set of knuckles, and only two of the proximal phalanges, the ones that run from your, you know, if you make a fist and you have your knuckles right there to the first set where you bend your finger, only two of those were still attached. And one of them was kind of twisted into the side after all this time. And there was no thumb, but you could clearly see. It looked like a hand, except that I wasn't quite sure what kind of exactly, because it did look a pinch different. Um, This is what threw me off. Most humans, when you look down at your hand, your pinky finger metacarpal would be shorter than your index finger, the one under your index finger. These would remind you of a kind of what I would picture a chimp hand to look like. Um, they were, weren't were maybe exactly the same size, but they were more in a uniform line. It was just very, very odd. Something was off about it, let me say that. So I didn't rush because I had never seen too many. I, had, I, you know, I didn't, wasn't familiar with all of the bones and the different animals that lived out in the woods back there. So I wasn't quick to alarm or alert anybody. I did hang on to it and started thinking about it a couple of days later. And one night I pulled out, my mother had a medical encyclopedia and I laid this hand down and I'm looking at the bones matching up the wrist bones and they're matching and then I'm matching up everything. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, I I have to call someone tomorrow morning because this could be somebody's loved one out in the woods here. So I did take it before I called my local police. I did um, take it over and show my neighbor because he used to be a police officer for many years and I wanted his opinion. And I pull it out and I show it to him. And he said, yep, that's a hand. And he said, are you going to call him? And he said, I would right now. So I called them and explained to them why I'm calling. And she sends someone right out. It happened to be a detective. And then he had an officer with him. And when I invited them in and I took it out and showed it to them, I did make note that the detective looked at the hand they both looked at the hand and then looked at each other and I thought that was kind of odd but then I did feel like well at least I didn't probably call them for no reason so he just they talked for a few minutes and he asked me for a paper bag do you have a paper bag not a plastic one because we are going to take it around the corner and let the doctor see it make confirm because um you know before we bother the crime scene people and everything And I said, okay, and I went and got it, and they leave. And then hours and hours and hours go by. It was like, you know, this was probably early morning, and I'd say it was maybe 4 o'clock before the doorbell rang. And I noticed it was just the officer, the younger officer. And I answered the door, and he says, oh, it's good news. He said it was a dog's paw. Well, I was a little taken back by that one. 
And I said, really? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's all it was, not to worry. And I think I must have looked shocked. And I said, a dog's paw. And I was trying to, you know, add it up in my head if that could have been a possibility after what I'd seen. And I did stop him. And I said, when he was turning around to leave, and I said, by the way, how did you know it was a dog's paw? Well, the vet told us. And I said, you went to a vet after you went to the doctor's office? And then when I started to question him too much more, he scurried off. Yeah. And that was the last I'd heard about it. But what always got me is I started thinking once they got to the doctor's office and the doctor said, nope, that wasn't a human. What made them take that next step? Yeah, that is kind of odd. That's very odd. And, you know, dog's paws don't look like human hands. You know, a bear, I guess I could kind of see maybe a bear, um, but even a bear, you can kind of tell it's a bear, a bear's paw. Um, And you don't really have a whole lot of bears out there in East Texas that I know of anyway. (laughs) Right, right. So that was an interesting thing. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. (laughs) And why bother coming back to even tell you? You know what I mean? They're just going to take it and do Mm -hmm. it. It's kind of weird to come back and even bother even telling you what they quote unquote think it was. Uh, Tell me about the sheriff that that shot one. Okay. Well, right about the time that we had got that audio out at Stubblefield, I had a very good friend of mine that worked for the county. And each day she used to have to be taken to the bank by um, a member of the law enforcement agency. And um, she was really quick to call me a couple of days after we had recorded the audio. And she tells me that um, her friend that took her today to the bank had a very interesting story. She was looking or listening to the video that we had taken in the National Forest of the audio. And when he asked her what um, she was watching or listening to, she kind of made the joke, well, you're probably going to think this is nuts, but He actually responded, no, he didn't think it was nuts because he had seen one before. And in fact, he had shot one before. Well, of course, you know, she's listening. And he says that about seven years prior, he happened to live in an area of the National Forest where a lot of activity is supposed to happen. Uh, He had been having a problem with what he thought were raccoons getting into his trash cans on his back patio next to the woods. He was very getting pretty frustrated and he even tried, I think, to use some heavy rocks and uh, it wasn't working. Well, this particular night, he heard them start rattling. I guess heard noises coming from around the can and he had a little a little gun with him of some type. I can't remember what it was, but it probably wasn't too, too big because he probably thought it was raccoons out there. And he had it in his hand and he was mad, about to put an end to whatever's going on probably. And when he opened the door, there this thing was. And he popped a shot at it and it took off into the woods. Well, he didn't give too much description except that when she I remember her saying, when I asked him what it looked like, he said it really looked like a person, kind of a wild looking person with a lot of hair. And that kind of surprised me because I thought, oh my God, that looks nothing like what I saw that night. And we're not that far away from each other. But so the story goes that he ended up calling some friends that he worked with and they tried to track this thing down to no avail. But in the meantime, some age government agencies heard about it and started showing up out there. And apparently everything seemed very normal so far. Like, you know, they were they were doing some, you know, collecting some hair or blood evidence and um, you know, talking with him. And in fact they They kind of cleaned everything up, of course, and left him some business cards that they were going to keep in touch with him. Well, the interesting part is after that evening, when he tried to get in touch with them to follow up, they were bogus numbers. They never went anywhere. And they purposely didn't have the agency name 
I remember, you know, that on the card. It wasn't like there was one specific name, like you could call up, you know, the CIA or whoever, you know, and ask to speak to this person. It was just a general, you know, we're, for, we're with the government, da da da. And then they, and interestingly enough, left him business cards that looked real, but never went anywhere. Yeah, it doesn't shock me one bit. And it takes a lot for a cop to shoot someone he thinks looks like a person. Um, that, that's very telling right there that, you know, if it would have been a person, I don't think a cop would have shot him. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, he read, from what I understand, he knew it wasn't right away. It was something scary and something different. But if he had, I know when she asked if you had to compare it or, or what could you tell me it looked like, I think he saw something that looked probably more human than what I saw through the binoculars. Yeah, and it's fascinating. I think down there in Texas specifically, um, I get all kinds of different descriptions. People say it looked very human-like. People say it looked more like a chimpanzee. People say it looked more like a gorilla. Um, I mean, I get the a rainbow of descriptions down there, unlike other areas. You know, like here in the Pacific Northwest, rarely will someone say, well, it looked just like a person. Generally, they'll describe it more like a gorilla or um, like a non-human primate. But in other parts of the country, they will describe it, hey, it looked very human-like. And that's what's fascinating about Texas is you get so many different descriptions. You know, you get the, it was a chimp, it was a, it looked like a gorilla, it looked like a person. You get that whole different description down there. And I find it fascinating, especially in that area. Texas is a big area. Yeah. You know, you could fit a few states inside Texas, but... Um, I, I think that they're down there, and generally it's more aggressive type of encounters. And I'm glad on your property you didn't really experience aggression. Mm -hmm. I, You know, and I've thought about this a couple of times before, and I think that the situation could have probably taken a turn many times because, and I think it can happen probably just an act, something accidental could happen that could change the whole outcome. Let's say that if I would have tripped and fell off that back deck and landed on the other side of the fence, I may have never been seen again. You know, I almost feel like sometimes innocent things could happen and maybe they're taken wrong. Who knows? Who knows what this thing thinks? You know what I mean? I didn't feel like it was out to bother us too much. In fact, I never heard any vocalizations besides those whistles. That one night, I did hear that very weird roar. But most of the time, it was almost like it was try not getting our attention, but like if, like, say, the, the sword on the swing set. It was almost like it was wanting to do it back. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, but it does. It does make sense. You know, we were lucky, I suppose. Yeah, I think a lot of times, it, you know, it really depends. I, I think in some situations, I think they'll try and avoid an altercation, even though it doesn't seem like they are. Uh, you know, sometimes they'll mm -hmm. throw rocks at you or they'll kind of come out and bum rush you. And I think at the end of the day, I don't know that they really truly want an altercation. Um, even though it feels right. like it at times, but there is other times where they, they, they're looking for a fight, you know, and they're, they're, in my opinion, um, I think it's mm -hmm. interesting. I always tell people, you know, if you have these things on your property, going back to your, the cop story, if you have these things on your property, call the cops, start calling the cops and start telling everyone about it. And a funny thing sure seems to happen. The government sure seems to show up and you'll see them on your property and they'll be there for a few days and then all of a sudden they're gone and there's no more activity. If you don't right. if you have these things on your property and you don't think the government's covering it up, cause a huge stink and trust me, you won't have any more activity on your property. And I, I can't really pinpoint what's going on with that, but um I truly feel like well, there is I a cover up. Well, I wanted to tell you, this was interesting. Uh when this happened, it made me think of it that what we were talking about, but I know about a year, year and a half ago, we were out on a forest service road. We had finished hiking and we were driving back and um, a ranger pulled us over. And um, we were in a little bit more remote, different part, but we had kind of went walking and looking around in a different part of the trail. So he pulled us over and um, he asked what we were doing out there, which I kind of thought that was weird for no reason. But actually... Um, was about two years ago. It was when people were talking about doing that geo catching. Isn't that what it's called? Geo, where, where you get yeah. the coordinates and go out and look for the little hidden thing in the tree or, 
it's like a, the kids were doing it a couple of years ago and they wanted us to go. And I explained to him what we were out there doing. And he said, well, you know, I'd be careful if I were you because, you know, a hiker, and I couldn't believe he said this, he goes, you know, last month a hiker just turned up missing out here and we hadn't seen him since. Well, I was kind of shocked he was telling us that. And my face went, really? And my first thought is, this is a small town. How in the world do we not know about this? That was my first thought because I came home and actually had to Google it because in a little tiny small Texas town, we know we usually know about people going missing. It's talked about, you know, it's on the news or in the paper. And for him to say that, it kind of threw me off. And he said, oh, yes, ma'am, you know, y'all just be careful out here. Well, I just thought that was one of the oddest things. I almost felt like he was kind of giving us a, y'all go on, it's in your best interest to get out of here. I don't know, it just yeah, struck me it as does. really weird. It, it, he probably was. He's probably trying to tell you to leave the area without telling you why. You know, sometimes you have to be careful and not like Stubblefield. I mean, there's people in Texas that ask me all the time, where where should I go? Where? And I'm like, go to Stubblefield, go armed. And go in a group. Don't go unarmed and don't go by yourself. But if you want to hear them, you know, go out there after midnight, you'll hear them. Um, and I yeah. think what he was basically trying to tell you was politely move along and don't stay yeah. in this area. Yeah. And, you know, um, yeah. it just yeah. amazes me. I wish they would just come out and say, hey, these things are real. You know, even if there's something else, lie to everyone and just say, well, it's a non-human primate. Um, you know, I they could come up with some mm-hmm. BS you know, yeah, explanation yeah. for it. Uh, but at least warn people. You know what I mean? I know. There's a lot of people in your situation, Denise, where you saw the thing through the binoculars. And uh, I had a gentleman on the other day, and he, or a couple of shows back, then he was talking about his mother and how she had drug and alcohol problems. And um, I'm, and the more him and I talked, the more I started thinking, I almost wonder if her drug and alcohol problems came from these things. Uh, one had kicked, oh, yeah. something had kicked up, kicked in the door. They, the, they, the family said it was a bear. He's like, I don't buy it, Aww. but she had to replace the door and she was feeding them. And I wish they would just come out and tell the public, Hey, listen, these things are real. You can run into them and just, you right. know, BS everyone, but, you know, kind of give them somewhat of a truth of, yes, they're real. They're, they're out there. And if you want to cover up what they actually are and all this, stuff, well, I don't know. I, I guess it would open a can of worms um, doing that. But I think the public has a right to know that these things are out there. You know, you're out, you're hiking with your family and you get a recording yeah. like this. I challenge any skeptic. Tell me what, what that noise is on your recording. Explain to me what animal that is. I, I'm willing to sit and right. listen to anyone, anyone skeptical listening to the show. The audio I played at the beginning of this interview, explain to me what animal that is. I'm all ears. Mm-hmm. I know. And there there's no answer. Uh, no one know, you know what I mean? It's like, well what is it's not a it's not a cougar, it's not a, a bear, it's not a we can go through all the animals and I guarantee you won't be able to line one of them up with what you recorded or what you and your son recorded, you know. It's it's um mm-hmm. they definitely are out there and I, I know. Well and I'll tell you, it's just natural to sit there and go are you, am I sure it's not a person? I think I even say it. Is that a person? <laughs> because you just can't believe it. But I, I do say that there is there is a reason they don't. I call it they've got a, they probably have a plot twist. There's going to be a plot twist in all of this somewhere. It's not going to be as easy as, as we think it's going to be. I don't know what that is, but everybody wait for the plot twist. Well, you're right. There is a plot plot twist. Very, I mean, you hit it right on the head. There's way more mm-hmm. to the story than just a non human out there, a non human primate out there running around. There's way more going on here, and that's why it's being covered up. It's not money. It's not the lumber industry. Right. It's not what you think it is. It's something else. And I agree with you. Uh, I think mm-hmm. it's going to open a can of worms they don't want to touch, and I don't blame them. Yeah. Hmm. But in the yeah, same, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes either. <laughs> no, but in the same breath, you know, they, they should warn people. You know, they should. Oh, yes. And like I said before, it's sure, you know, I'm going to do an upcoming show. There's a guy who shot one, and he sent me pictures of the bullet, the hair, the blood, the bone, everything. And w- wait till you hear what happened to that guy. And like I said, if you really want these things off your property, start calling the police. And pretty soon mm-hmm. you'll have someone else show up. 
and you won't have any more problems. And so uh, maybe that's the answer for getting rid of them, you know, if you don't want to dig too right. deep. Yes, because if you bother them enough or make enough noise, then they want to keep it quiet. And it makes you wonder why they just can't get these teams together a little bit more if they needed to. <laughs> you know, it's like it's only when when you when they finally been people have been pushed so far or people have gone missing or a big enough mess has been made. Well, then we might do something to help you out a little bit. Well, I think most 99% of the time, if you're just describing an encounter or you're talking about what's going on in your property, 99% of the time, nothing's going to happen. Now, if you shoot one or you collect evidence, real evidence, now you become a priority. Then they they are going to focus in on you. Um, they don't really care about your story. They don't really care about what you saw. When you start collecting real evidence, now you become a huge, huge liability, huge problem. Yes. Yes. But Denise, I, I really appreciate you coming on. I, I enjoyed, I really enjoyed talking with you last night. I enjoyed talking to you on the air and thank you so much well, thank for you. taking the time to come on. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. And I want to thank you too. And I'll tell you, I think you have some of the great, the greatest guests and the most down to earth people. I just enjoy the website and the show so much. And you seem like a really great guy. And thanks for all you do. And you're so kind and patient with everybody. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, sweetie, for the nice words. Yes. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. You get a chance to check out sasquatchchronicles.com. Become a member. Get additional shows. I will be back on Sunday for the members. Until next time, everyone. Something to eat something, a quiet time